from Channel 5 New York, this is a Fox News update. Good evening. At 10 tonight, what's ahead now that Ortega is out in Nicaragua? A round-the-world custody battle over seven-year-old Hillary is being fought now in New Zealand. Her mother was jailed rather than give her up. Now her dad is there trying to see her. Our undercover report on how the drug methadone is being sold illegally on our streets. Judy has something to warm you up. Robin looks at whether rock videos have too much sex and violence. We'll see you at 10. Coming up next, the people of Nicaragua said no to Ortega. The tug of love for little Hillary is now an around-the-world battle. And uh, look at how methadone is being sold illegally in the streets. And Robin on whether there's too much sex and violence on rock videos. We'll see you soon. It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? From WNYW Fox Channel 5 in New York, this is the 10 o'clock news with John Rowland and Cora Ann Mahalik. Good evening. Chalk up another one for democracy. Daniel Ortega got the boot from the people of Nicaragua. And he says he is going to bow to the majority and turn over power. Washington couldn't be happier. Cuba now is the only communist outpost now, and a lot of people are betting that Castro won't last that much longer. Niles Latham reports. Washington has spent the better part of the last decade trying to get rid of Daniel Ortega. And now, after all the strife, the Iran-Contra scandal, and backing a civil war that killed more than 30,000 people, Washington appears to be getting its wish. On Sunday, Nicaraguans went to the polls in large numbers in an election monitored by international observers, including former President Jimmy Carter. The results took everyone by surprise. Dissident publisher Violeta Chamorro won outright with 54% of the vote. Ortega mustered only 42% from an electorate weary from years of violence and economic hardship. After the vote, the Sandinistas promised a peaceful transition of power from Marxism to democracy. Tomorrow had the backing of the Bush administration, which helped her raise thousands of dollars through Republican partisans. The president hailed the victory. For years, the people of Nicaragua have suffered, and today the people of Nicaragua have spoken. And now is the time uh, for Nicaragua to move forward to freedom. Mr. Bush also said, as far as he is concerned, the lengthy military campaign of the Nicaraguan Contra rebels is now over. And he said he's considering plans to restore diplomatic and economic ties and lift the harsh economic sanctions that ruined Nicaragua's economy. The president also took the unusual step of praising Daniel Ortega for allowing free and fair elections to take place. Ironically, had Ortega won, the U.S. would have been forced to have taken similar steps to normalize relations with Nicaragua. But now that its candidate won, the Bush administration is choosing to celebrate what it calls yet another chapter in this historic season of change inside the Soviet bloc. At the White House, Niles Latham, Fox News, Channel 5. The opinion polls had said Ortega was ahead, but while people were afraid to tell a stranger their true feelings, they lost their fear in the voting booth. But the woman they voted for still faces many problems. Fox reporter Pablo Guzman reports. The surprise victory scored by Violeta Chamorro and the 14 different factions who make up her UNO party, which defeated the Sandinistas at the ballot box, has temporarily caused a dramatic shift of forces in the most sensitive part of the Western Hemisphere. We've demonstrated to the world, she said, that the Nicaraguans are a people who want to live in democracy. The election in Nicaragua has repercussions throughout the region. In El Salvador, the Sandinista defeat means the FMLN loses the support of a friendly government in its guerrilla war against the Salvadorian government. It means that Costa Rica is strengthened as the voice of the political center. For Honduras, it means that in the short run, there will be an easing of the tensions which came from its status as a battleground between Contras and Sandinistas. But for Cuba, the Sandinista loss is only bad news because it is now alone as the only socialist government in the hemisphere. In a dramatic and emotional speech, outgoing President Daniel Ortega said it was never the Sandinista intent to cling to power, only to overthrow the dictator Somoza, which they did over 10 years ago, and, he said, to bring democracy to Nicaragua. The Sandinista way to democracy, however, put it at odds with U.S. interests, and even as they fought U.S.-backed countries at home, Ortega and company fought the war of public opinion, often within the U.S., such as during an interview conducted while on a jog at Central Park's Sheep Meadow. 
ellos que son están en contra de la ley, ellos que son, vamos a decir, Back then, we discussed the suspension of civil liberties against those Ortega said conspired against the government. Now he and the Sandinistas are out of government. And how the Sandinistas respond to this new development, and how Violeta Chamorro presides over disputes on her side, and what Bush and company will do, all will add to the already volatile situation in this region. Pablo Guzman, Fox News, Channel 5. Dr. Elizabeth Morgan and her husband, Dr. Eric Fortich, are carrying the battle over their seven-year-old daughter halfway around the world. Dr. Morgan went to jail for more than two years rather than tell where the little girl was. But now that she's been located in New Zealand, her father is there. And her mother would like to be, but lost her passport during that stay in jail. Her supporters are busy manning the fax machines. Yvette Sands reports. The school, which has known her real identity all along, has been determined to protect its most controversial pupil. Several burly security guards now keep watch over Hillary, and this includes making sure the media doesn't get too close. At the same time as Hillary and her classmates went off for swimming lessons, her father, Dr Eric Foritich, arrived in Auckland from LA. His recent courting of the media in the United States was lacking in his approach today. Uh, I have no comment. I don't know what we're doing right now. I believe that we're going to our attorney's office to decide. Foritich was then whisked off for a meeting with his lawyer in the city. It's not known when he'll go to Christchurch. In the meantime, Hillary's grandparents are preparing their case for the family court hearing. I've been fine. We're a little bit tired, but we're getting along very well. Thank you. Just how the tug of love over Hillary will progress from here is likely to be decided in Christchurch's family court shortly. But the US pro-Morgan camp is already targeting New Zealand media with information regarding previous court hearings. Evidence of sexual abuse rejected in court by a Washington judge is being faxed to newsrooms around the country. Yvette Sands, Fox News, New Zealand. And back here at home, one of the worst child abuse cases in our city ended today in a Brooklyn courtroom. A mother who stood by and watched her five-year-old daughter savagely beaten was sentenced. Five-year-old Jessica Cortez died from that beating back in 1988. The judge had to order Abigail Cortez brought into court. The 26-year-old mother had refused to enter the courtroom to hear her sentence. She claimed she was afraid of the TV cameras. Her attorney says the publicity has other prisoners tormenting and taunting her at Rikers Island. But Judge Ruth Moskowitz was not sympathetic. You sat back over months and months and months of your children beaten and you watched. You, you did nothing, although help was available, you did nothing. Jessica Cortez died a year ago last December, beaten to death by her mother's live-in boyfriend, Adrian Lopez. He pled guilty to the murder last November. Jessica's nine-year-old brother, Nicholas, was found in a closet in the same apartment, badly beaten, with ten broken bones. He barely survived. The reason why this sentence is as lenient as it is, is to spare Nicholas the ordeal of testifying. Not because this court has any sympathy for you. Then the judge sentenced Abigail Cortez to five to fifteen years in prison. Nicholas is now in foster care. Meanwhile, Cortez's boyfriend is serving a sentence of 22 years to life. Well, still ahead, a new study on the high number of black men in trouble with the law. An exclusive report how a drug that helps addicts kick the habit is falling into the wrong hands. And the latest on the firebombing in Mount Vernon that left 20 people homeless, including our narcotics detective. Plus, a look at some of the steamy music videos that some people say go, uh, go too far. Robin Carter begins her special series, Sex, Rock, and Videotape. Man in the straw house, children. Heroin was once presented to the world as the answer to addiction to other drugs. I was a cub reporter in this town more than 20 years ago when methadone came along to give the heroin addict some help. One of the stories we all did then had to do with the addicts selling it illegally on the streets, methadone. And sadly, as Jeff Weiser reports, some things don't change. This is what we found on the streets of Harlem, not far from a methadone treatment center on 125th Street. Mike is paying Nelson about $50 for two bottles of methadone, a drug normally given to help addicts withdraw from heroin. Nelson got the two extra vials from a clinic on Friday. They're supposed to be his two dosages for the weekend. He says he can live without them, so he's selling them. Nelson claims he'll use the money for food. But others use the methadone money to buy other drugs like crack. 
Why is Mike buying the methadone? He says he likes the feel. How long have you been doing it? Me, uh, a few years. A few years? Yeah. Now, do you think that you're addicted to it? No, I'm not addicted to it. Uh, the, the addiction to uh, methadone is very bad. It's, uh, the withdrawal is, is really something you really don't want to go through. It's worse than heroin. So methadone, meant to help addicts, is being peddled on the street like any other illicit drug. Anthony LaForteza, a Wall Street financial analyst, lost a best friend eight years ago when he died after coming off methadone treatment. Ever since then, LaForteza has kept an eye on the program. He calls for changes, such as requiring seven-day-a-week dispensing so that additional bottles won't be on the streets. To get this particular drug off the streets, the only way to do it would be a massive control. Uh, either you're going to control it or you're going to just let it go rampant. And that would be really a terrible tragedy in many patients' lives. Beth Israel Medical Center runs the largest drug treatment program in the U.S., providing treatment for heroin addicts at 23 clinics throughout the city. Well, we have 7,800 patients. Half of them are employed. Another 12 or 13 percent are full-time homemakers or involved in school or training programs. They would not be able to have lives like this if they had to go to a clinic seven days a week. This is the way the methadone program is supposed to work. Patients addicted to heroin drink a daily safe dosage of the prescription drug. They do it in clinics like this one on Delancey Street. Methadone prevents withdrawal symptoms and drug craving. And as proponents say, its use is the most effective method of rehabilitation for heroin addicts. 34-year-old Susan, who now works in legal research, tried out all sorts of drug treatment centers. None worked until she got into the methadone program. Uh, it's always been good for me. Um, and it, it's really enabled me to function without going back into drug use all the time. It's ironic that methadone, meant to help, is being sold on the streets as another way to get high. But the proponents say its benefits outweigh any negative aspects. And here in New York, Mayor Dinkins has formed a committee to look into ways to improve methadone treatment programs. From Manhattan, Jeff Weiser, Fox News, Channel 5. A new study shows nearly a quarter of young American black men are either behind bars, on probation, or parole. The study was done by a nonprofit organization that promotes alternative punishments and sentencing reform. The percentage of white men in the very same age group was much lower, a little over 6% are currently in the criminal justice system. John? Well, Corin, back in uh, 1976, a man by the name of Eugene Hollander made a deal to stay out of jail. He owned nursing homes. He was also a crook, convicted for Medicaid fraud. And he agreed to sell his Cobble Hill nursing home to the community group that runs it. Now he says he wants more money than the state had said was fair. A state Supreme Court judge uh, isn't too happy with the price either, and he delayed the sale. But City Council President Andrew Stein says the judge is a disgrace. Judge held is a disgrace to the judicial profession. The Cobble Hill nursing home should be sold to the nonprofit operators immediately and should be sold at the price set by the state. Now, over 500 senior citizens live in that nursing home. They say that if Hollander doesn't keep up his end of the plea bargain, neither should the state, and he should go to jail. Coran? And, John, that lawsuit by a female doctor who is dying from AIDS is on hold. That's because a juror got sick. But any deal to end legal action also appears to be on hold. And no one's saying why. Rosanna Scotto reports. The cards were on the table, but nobody wanted to show their hand. That was the way the game was played at State Supreme Court in Brooklyn. A potential deal to settle the $175 million lawsuit between Dr. Veronica Prego, who is dying of AIDS, and the city ended mysteriously. I'm very angry because I believe that the Health and Hospitals Corporation continues to act in a reprehensible manner. On Friday, the Health and Hospitals Corporation called a press conference fueling speculation that a settlement was imminent. But now Prego's attorneys are hinting the deal is off and HHC is to blame. It doesn't oh, even have, have to, to do with, with the sums, sums of money. It has to do with the way they treat her. We're not going to let Dr. Prego be beat up by the city of New York, which is what has happened, and I think everyone, including from the mayor on down, ought to be ashamed of themselves 
in the way they have carried on in this case. While Prego's attorneys talked, they didn't divulge any specifics. The only thing that was certain was the trial was going forward, entering its eighth week. Prego already testified she became infected with AIDS when she stuck her finger with a needle used on an AIDS patient. She claims the needle was left by Dr. Joyce Fogel in the patient's bed at Kings County Hospital. The doctor's attorneys continue to accuse the city of wasting time while their client is dying this time dangling a possible settlement before her eyes. We believe that this case has been delayed and that it's in their interest to continue to delay this. Two months of her life, of her shortened life, have been used up in this courtroom. And we are, both of us, Diane and I, are committed to get this woman her day in court and get this trial over with. Stanley Friedman, the lawyer for HHC, says he couldn't comment except to say that he's under a gag order. But Prego's attorneys managed to work around that, expressing their anger over the way their client is being treated. From State Supreme Court in Brooklyn, Rosanna Scotto, Fox News, Channel 5. And coming up, Jesse Jackson's decision on running for mayor of the nation's capital. And the latest on the firebombing that left 20 people homeless in Mount Vernon. Tonight on Newsline New York, we'll explore the legacy that was Malcolm Forbes, the vast business empire that he leaves behind. Tonight at 11.30 on Fox 5. Detectives are still trying to find out if someone deliberately torched a house that was owned by a Mount Vernon police investigator. They think one person died in that fire. The officer, though, and his family got out alive. Penny Crone reports. You have to realize that we went through a very serious fire there with a lot of uh, mysteries to it right now. It's a horrible job sifting through the charred rubble and the cherished items that once spelled home. As many as 20 people lost everything and it's believed one man lost his life after he tried to save others. 34-year-old Jerry Wiley is missing. He lived on the third floor of this house. Wiley apparently woke up Ernest Kennedy and his family when he smelled smoke. Wiley then disappeared. Kennedy is a Mount Vernon police officer who works with the commissioner. Originally, there was speculation someone was out to get Kennedy. Witnesses say they saw someone running from the house on South 9th Avenue. While the cops believe someone deliberately set the fire, they don't think Kennedy was the target. As far as we can determine, there's absolutely no connection between the police officer and the incident. The fact that he lives in the building and this thing occurred is purely coincidental, in our opinion. Police won't admit to having a suspect, but there are indications the investigation is focusing on one man. Kennedy hasn't gone back to work yet. He's trying to figure out where his wife, daughter, and one-year-old granddaughter will go now. I just feel very hurt inside because everything that I saved all through the years is gone and just like that, you know. And I, I have nothing, nothing left. I have nothing, you know. Penny Crone, Fox News, Channel 5. There's been lots of guessing about Jesse Jackson's political future, but he has put to rest some of that speculation. Jackson says he will not run for mayor of Washington, D.C., but will continue to work on the national level. And back home, Mayor Dinkins says he is giving up his subsidized co-op on Riverside Drive. He lived there for more than 25 years, but now he's at Gracie Mansion and says he cannot afford the $700 a month it costs to keep the apartment. Well, coming up next, what's ahead for Malcolm Forbes' business now that he's gone? And on this one of the coldest days of the year, Judy has a warm-up for spring and summer. Hot, hot, hot. Oh, <laughs> all right, Nick will be along in a few minutes with the cold facts about the weather, but if you were outside at all, I don't have to tell you that it was downright unfriendly. Lynn White reports. New Yorkers woke up this morning to record cold temperatures, single digits. Even though it's February, few were prepared. It's very cold. Cold indeed, especially given the fact that just last Friday, the temperature soared into the upper 60s. I don't like it when it's this cold. This kind of cold makes people high and low, getting pneumonia, the flu, and everything. You love the cold? Sure, it's great. <laughs> What's your secret? Uh, lots of thermal underwear and a big wool coat. And a nice shiny badge. And a nice shiny badge, right. I love the cold. You love the cold? Yes. Why do you love the cold? Because I sell gloves. It's make money. Make money. <laughs> but you're nice and tan. Well, 
I make money from the gloves and I go down to Florida on a vacation. Now sadly when the temperature does drop this low, the first usually to suffer are the homeless. And so it was that the city's subways and shelters were swollen with those who have no place to call home. But for the most part, New Yorkers just seem to take this day of frigid air in their stride. I love it. I miss nobody. In all of this, there is a bit of warming and good news for you. Tomorrow, the temperature is expected to rise by at least 15 degrees. And spring is just three and a half short weeks away. Lynn White, Fox News, Channel 5. Yes, sirree, and this cold weather, of course, is forcing us to bundle up. But here's a warm thought. It won't be long. We'll soon be slipping into something skimpier. Mm-hmm. Judy Licht has a preview of this year's hot new swimsuits. If this is not the coldest day of the year, it sure feels like it, which means it's very definitely time to enjoy something that is... Hot, hot, hot. If you think the hottest thing on the beach this summer will be the sun, think again. The new swimsuits are surfacing in the stores and in some of the sweller southern climes. And this year, the bosom is back with a vengeance. I think we'll focus on the bass for a change. We were always focusing on the lakes. Now we will focus more in the upper body. I think that a woman wants to show her femininity. And I think that the bass is one of the most feminine things that a woman has. The bandeau top is big on everything from bikinis to one-piece maillots, and the more controlling bra top is also popular. With all that emphasis above, though, there's a little less leg showing this year, but the bikini is also making a big comeback. The bikini is also much more covering than it used to cover before because we do like a high pant, it's a high, it's a two-piece, and it covers more, and then more people can wear it. So the good news is the suits are getting more flattering than ever, and we have about three and a half more months of dieting to get ready for them. Judy Lick, Fox News, Channel 5. Wall Street had a mixed day. The Dow was up 38 points. Winning stocks beat the losers on the big board by a margin of about 9 to 7. The price of a share was up 35 cents. But on the American exchange, the price of a share was down 2 cents, and the index there was down nearly a point. And Wall Street, of course, as a place, signifies capitalism, and Malcolm Forbes personified it. He knew how to live, and he knew how to die. He died in his sleep Saturday. He was 70 years old. His family held a private service for him in New Jersey. There were bagpipes, of course. He loved them. They will probably also play at the public memorial service at St. Bart's on Park Avenue Thursday morning. Forbes' ashes will be buried on a Fiji island the family owns. And now, of course, the family takes over the business, and that is going to be a challenge. Father Forbes was one of a kind. Christopher Jones reports. To live longer... Uh, uh, <laughs> to enjoy it all because I'm not sure that the, in the next round I'll be in such a catbird seat so I'm not in a hurry to leave this one. It was one of the few wishes that did not come true for Malcolm Forbes. He did not get to live forever even though a man who loved life as much as he did should have. Nevertheless he did get one wish he died just as he hoped to. Yeah I hope it happened someday. I don't, right. Never is a long time. I would like to go to bed and wake up dead. And while no one lives forever, some are kind of expected to. And that expectation may be doubly true for a man's children. But wishing will not make it so. And now the five Forbes children have the task of settling the billion-dollar estate, pay the taxes on the estate, which could be more than 50% of its worth, and have something left over to protect the empire. Forbes family-held enterprises include Forbes and American Heritage magazines, hundreds of thousands of pieces of fine art, and huge real estate holdings in the United States and abroad. But the heart of the business is the magazine, and the soul of the magazine was Malcolm Forbes. So is there a future without Malcolm? You can't lose somebody with the energizing spirit and the promotional flair of a Malcolm Forbes and say things are just the same. Uh, I don't think advertisers will go away because Malcolm is gone, but clearly his persona drew advertisers to him and to the magazine and this will be a little harder to get some of that extra advertising without Malcolm being around to take them out on the Highlander I think number five now the consensus seems to be Forbes magazine will survive and prosper without Malcolm Forbes behind it but no one believes this will not be a changed magazine without the force of his personality in its pages Forbes the capitalist tool will go on but the master mechanic will be sorely missed. Christopher Jones, Fox News, New York.
And Jack Cafferty will have a lot more for you on Malcolm Forbes tonight on his Newsline New York. Jack. Cora Ann, a little later we're going to examine the Forbes legacy. We'll talk with Robin Leach who chronicles some of the Forbes glamour on the program Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. We will talk with the publisher of New York Magazine, Edward Kozner, about what Forbes Magazine meant in the world of publishing. And we'll talk with Wall Street Journal reporter Chris Winnens, who is writing an unauthorized biography of Malcolm Forbes, all on Newsline, coming up at 11.30. John Coran. All right, Jack, still ahead on the 10 o'clock news. The Red Cross is changing its image to attract young volunteers. Robin Carter takes a look at the shocking trend in music videos, sex, rock, and videotape. And then the amazing with sports, the latest setback in baseball talks does not bode well for the start of the season. And Stewart will be along to review a new movie, a comedy called Rosalie Goes Shopping. Penetration of... Uh... Classified data. The American Red Cross has a very rich past, always there through all kinds of wars, disasters, blood drives, but now it wants a more modern image to attract younger volunteers. They kicked off a new campaign at the Palladium. It is called Play Your Part. The public service commercial features a lot of famous musicians, including Carly Simon and Richie Havens. And the campaign is also getting some help from Paul Schaefer of late night fame. We are celebrating the Red Cross of today, an exciting, vital, energetic organization full of young, forward-thinking volunteers. It says like me here, well, two, young, forward-thinking, two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> and the Red Cross is hoping to recruit some uh, more volunteers between the ages of 18 and 34. Gora? And John, rock and roll videos are getting more spicy, yes, these days. It used to be parents only had to worry about raunchy rock lyrics, but, as Robin Carter tells us tonight, a new concern is sex, rock, and videotape as she begins her special series. Robin? Well, Cora, and you know, when we were growing up, we had to use our imaginations to visualize just what some of those rock and roll songs were really all about. But all of that changed when MTV brought music videos into our living rooms. Since then, videos have reinvented pop culture at the speed of light, and now, more than ever, rock stars have become role models for our young. Now, while the marriage of music and video have boosted record sales to an all-time high, some people feel performers are now pushing the limits of decency to an all-time low. Uh, I, think, I think sex and, uh, is a really, really the subject for the 90s. A lot of your videos have been pretty sexy. Did that come naturally to you? Well... <laughs> <laughs> As with any new form of uh, media technology, it's, um, it's used by the majority quite badly, but when, when people use it correctly, I think it can be really, really uh, inspirational. Well, music videos have certainly given pop stars new and novel ways of expressing themselves, but let's face it, the real goal of these glossy vignettes is to sell, 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 and sex has become the operative word. Well, shocking is a pretty good way to sell a record, or to sell certain records. You know? um, they want to get attention, they want to stand out. And it works. These sultry video victims help make rocker Robert Palmer another smoldering pinup girl sprinkled through the videos of White Snake help put them.